Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in the Twig Game Data Com video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with two pieces of AMD news. The first being the AMD Feng Huang APU, which sports 28 compute units. We'll get into that in a moment, along with AMD's increased support for the Vulkan API. And then we're going to finish the video on a somewhat strange note, actually, concerning Intel. And that is Intel are cutting the inside program, which has been part of its marketing strategy for, well, quite the longest time, and that's putting it mildly. But, as I said, we'll start things out with AMD. I'd like to thank Alan, before I forget, for sending me the link to Sysoft Sandra, where you can find this particular entry. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description, but you can see it on screen anyway. So what is this particular APU? Well, it is pretty ginormous. It sports 28 compute units, meaning 1,792 shaders. To put that into some level of context, that is bigger than, let's say, the original PlayStation 4 APU, but it isn't as big as, let's say, the Xbox One X or, let's say, the PlayStation 4 Pro. However, for desktop APUs, it's about the biggest that's been manufactured, at least for this generation. So, what type of specifications are we looking at? Well, it looks like a lot of those specifications are not finalized yet, and that's putting it um, mildly. For example, the clock speed is currently reading as 555 megahertz, which is A, a random ass number, and B, obviously far lower than what you'd assume even for an APU. So what does this mean? Well, it's most likely an engineering sample slash an early sample, or Sysoft Sandra is likely not reading it correctly. Which one that proves to be accurate obviously doesn't really matter for us as customers because we're going to be getting it running at much higher clock speeds but from the sake of a release schedule obviously if sysoft or the drivers are not reading the uh, clock speed correctly the clock speed of 555 megahertz is obviously still very early and most likely we're going to see this ramp up considerably in terms of raw clock speed what to well obviously we don't know that yet but even a modest clock speed could see around two and a half to perhaps even three and a half, possibly four T-flops of FP32 performance. The number of um, CPU cores is also a bit of a mystery. There have been some rumors that we will see up to eight CPU cores, up to eight Zeppelin dies, if you prefer, featured in an APU at some point or another, but it's yet to actually surface. So perhaps there is a chance this could be it. Perhaps the strangest specifications are 16 kilobytes of level 2 and 2 gigabytes of memory at 32 bits. Obviously something is really hinky there. Most likely if it's listing 2 gigabytes, it's, well, somewhat possible at least that we'll be looking at HBM2. And the memory clocks are also listed at 2400 megahertz, which also doesn't make sense. Either way, the 32-bit memory bus, of course, is completely and utterly wrong. So most likely, some of the entries here are simply just being misreported by Sysoft Sandra, which does, of course, lead us to some speculation whether the 555 megahertz that's also being reported are just completely and utterly wrong. Either way, at least it's encouraging that we're seeing this particular APU surface in Sysoft Sandra. Perhaps we might see this uh, particular processor uh, hitting store shelves at some point, uh, you know, the first quarter or possibly the second half of next year with any luck. So on to the next piece of AMD news. This one specifically revolves around their graphics cards or more specifically the graphics APIs. Um, you might have heard of Vulkan. Now, obviously, Vulkan is probably about the best appy when it comes to developers if they're looking to put their game across multiple platforms. Because Vulkan works on Linux, it works on mobile platforms, it works on Windows PCs, you get the idea. And AMD are doing a lot of investment when it comes to Vulkan. Recently, a chap by the name of Terry Macadon, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, has had a brief interview with PC Games N. I'll link that in the video description. I'll read out his uh, uh, couple of quotes here. A lot of new features we're going to have are going to show Vulcan. So what we're going is heavy with Vulcan. We're investing quite a bit with Vulcan this year and especially next year. Why we're investing in Vulcan, but we're not seeing the games into it? Maybe because we see what's coming and we think that Vulcan is worth the investment. 
I can't say what's coming. I can say that we're investing in Vulcan and we wouldn't be investing in something that's a dead end road, end quote. Obviously, if you read between the lines here and they're not particularly subtle lines, AMD are essentially saying, hey, we really believe in this API. And although we can't tell you the games, which are, um, you know, in development, specifically what APIs they're using, we know that they're going to be really big titles. Obviously, at the end of the day, games developers are working alongside AMD. They're working alongside Microsoft. They're working alongside uh, NVIDIA and all of these different companies for optimization and saying, hey, these are what the architectures are coming up in the future. And developers will obviously say, well, OK, we need to tweak our engines like this or like that. So obviously, the fact of the matter is there must be some really big titles that are coming out in the future that AMD feel confident is going to help propel Vulcan to a larger market share. Now, I'm not saying I dislike DirectX 12. Personally, I really like the API. Uh, as a non-developer, I, I like the performance of it. However, from a purely, I say, customer-focused point of view, I think Vulcan is probably the better API. Now, I'm not particularly a big Linux gamer. I'll just admit that. However, I do want the platform, that is Linux, to also succeed and also mobile development and from a development point of view it makes a lot of sense with Vulcan. Now that isn't to say that Vulcan doesn't have a lot of groundwork and we've discussed this in depth. We've got a couple of Vulcan specific interviews on the channel if you fancy them. Uh, a couple of them are from NVIDIA's Neil Trevitt so you can go ahead and check those out if you want. But I do really like the Vulcan API. So if AMD do think that this technology is going to be worthy of the investment I do wonder what games we're going to see. One of the possibilities is Metro Exodus, um, simply because we've seen OpenGL uh, being heavily supported by the developers previously, especially when they were porting the games over to Linux. And obviously, um, Cloud Imperium switched to Vulkan when it came to uh, Star Citizen, rather than using DirectX 12. And before anyone asks, no, I don't think DirectX 12 is going anywhere. At the end of the day, if you are targeting a Windows-specific platform, and when I say Windows-specific, I include the Xbox in this as well, at the end of the day, you might as well really push the usage of DirectX 12 as your development path. Now, we'll talk about a somewhat less good thing, and also a very curious thing. And this comes to us from a website by the name of CRN, CRN.com. That's not CNN, CRN.com. Once again, I'll link it in the video description. Now, according to their sources, and obviously I can't comment on the validity of this, Intel are slashing its iconic Intel Inside program. Now, for those who don't know, it's a major source of funding that have helped both OEMs and channel partners, and it really has helped the sales of PC. And many analysts have actually... Um, said it's a significant percentage and according to the industry uh, sources who have uh, given this information they're predicting it's between 40 and 60 percent so let's go with the middle of that 50 percent and I'm going to read out a specific quote we're hearing that a lot of major cuts are coming from Intel's marketing and channel programs this is according to a top executive for a major Intel partner who has been informed of the cuts. The marketing funds have been moved to other groups within Intel that aren't channel specific or PC centric. The funds will go towards driving the business in data center, giving more to the data side of the house instead of compute, and a lot of dollars are moving to other areas or kept in house to improve Intel's profit and margins." End quote. Now, Intel themselves did confirm to CRN that there will be changes, quote unquote, to the Intel Inside program, but they did not specify or confirm what changes are going to be or what cuts they are going to make. Okay, so what does this mean to you and I? Does that mean we're just going to see fewer advertisements when it comes to uh, Intel or Intel Inside? After all, that program has been going on for about 26 years now. And it is, without question, one of the biggest marketing programs, especially when it comes to technology that the world's ever seen. Uh, we've all heard the familiar diding when it comes to the Intel Inside, and we saw it with the Pentium 2s, the Pentium 1s, and a lot of people did not like the Intel Inside uh, program, and that's putting it mildly, but I don't really want to get into the business ethics in this particular uh, news. We've discussed that previously. 
the big question is what ramifications is it going to have with us, you know, with the end user. Surely it's just going to be fewer advertisements, right? Which isn't a bad thing. Not so much. Uh, according to the CEO of this particular company, he said that he believes the funding cuts to ha are going to have a ripple effect across the entire Intel ecosystem. Intel is a piece of everything we do. When you have cut in funding like this within, with a vendor that has 90% share of the PC and server market, there's going to be major ramifications to OEMs, partners and customers. And this is the kind of crap, his words, not mine, that rolls downhill. Intel is facing a major cost, cost challenge, excuse me, and it's disappointing but not surprising. Now, it is a fairly lengthy report, and I don't want to eat up the majority of the video simply talking about this. As I said, I'll link it in the video description. However, what is quite clear here is that Intel are not so focused now on producing um, chips, I suppose, with us in mind, with gamers in mind, with you know, someone who's perhaps doing their office work in mind. Instead, they're going off after the lucrative server market of data centers, of R&D when it comes to the GPU market. Don't forget, they've recently um, bought in Raja Kadori um, from AMD to now help develop their GPUs. We've discussed their technologies like X-Point, like the Nirvana chips, and ultimately, that's really where Intel are seeing a lot of cash in the future. That doesn't, of course, mean that they don't want to sell their Pentium processors and all these other chips that they're releasing, but it does mean that the company do know where the future's heading, at least in terms of the most lucrative sources of funding. Now, the reason, of course, this is particularly interesting in terms of timing is the fact that AMD have been, I wouldn't say pummeling them or anything like that in the CPU sales because they've not. Intel, at the end of the day, are still Intel. And it's quite telling that even the 7700K was pretty much level with uh, the Ryzen 7s at one point on, through Amazon. Consider the 7700K is basically a dead platform at this point. I mean, I don't mean that in a harsh respect. It's like, if you have the chip, it's a good chip. But compare that to like the 8700Ks or the Ryzen 7s in terms of the value proposition, I think I think most people would agree that the 7700K just isn't a particularly value orientated chip now. It's not a very good purchase unless you can get it at a steep discount. AMD have been very aggressive when it came to pricing. I mean, the Threadripper chips, I think it was like 200 bucks went off of the some of the Threadrippers and then some of the Ryzen's went down significantly over Black Friday and I suspect it's going to do very much the same over the short term when it comes to like Christmas and perhaps even, you know, early next year with the sales. What I'm basically getting at here, however, is that AMD are in a very different position. They never had the Intel inside program to begin with, and AMD, quite frankly, just want any money that they can get. With that said, they have also been rather successful in the um, server market as well, and we've heard Microsoft are backing them, HP are backing them, Dell, of course. So the bottom line is this, for customers this sucks because prices could go up, especially of pre-built systems. I'm going to be curious to see how AMD responds to this. Now, if AMD were very, very, very aggressive with their prices, assuming they can be, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the companies, some of the OEMs, shift to AMD if they can get good deals, which could be rather interesting. In fact, I do wonder if that's going to bite Intel in the butt in the long term, because ultimately mindshare is incredibly important. But as we all know, it takes a long time for the industry to start making these shifts. So I guess all we can do really is wait. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one. Are you happy about this, even if it does lead to higher prices, especially of Intel chips? Do you hope companies just move to AMD? Or do you not share either of those opinions and think something entirely different? As usual, let me know in the comments. With all of that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.